Good evening, and welcome to the very last uh, Sagan event of the semester. Uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to take a moment to say a few words about this um, experience and to offer some sincere thanks. Running the Sagan National Colloquium has been quite an intellectual challenge and a very rich and rewarding one. I've learned incredibly exciting things from every single speaker, and my own intellectual inquiries into water history will be so much richer and more meaningful as a result of meeting and hearing from these people who have been themselves so generous with their time and energies. But I also wanted to add that I feel incredibly lucky to have had the opportunity to learn from our students as well. As director of the colloquium, I was able to read the student responses to the speakers and to, um, to get a much better sense of our current students' interests and concerns and ambitions about their intellectual and personal passions, and I feel like I know all of you and the OBU student body so much more as a result of directing this colloquium. Um, I am glad to have been able to provide in some small way these springboards for exploring interdisciplinarity and for encouraging um, and showing so many speakers who are themselves models for the, the value of letting curiosity, engagement, and lifelong learning drive both um, careers and, and futures. And my first thanks, therefore, is to the students of UC150 for being such active participants in the series, but also for being so open with me about your responses and for giving me this chance to learn more about your interests and passions. But I know, and I'm looking at many of you right now, I know, however, that the audience for these talks has been bigger than the students for UC150. Uh, and I want to thank each and every one of you, students, faculty, staff, members of the broader community. I know um, that all of our speakers felt welcomed by you. They felt challenged by your questions, and they were delighted by the strength and diversity of our audiences. And your presence throughout the series has enriched the experience for everyone. So thank you so much for prioritizing uh, sorry, prioritizing as many of the events as you all did as individuals. Finally, the staff at OWU who have helped me run this series have been truly fantastic. From helping me plan and implement publicity to getting this room set up every week and to running all of the AV and doing so many of the behind the scenes things that until I started running this, I had no idea what went on behind, um, behind the Sagan Colloquium. I basically want to thank all of them for really, to go back to our very first theme, making the whole colloquium look like a duck. Running smoothly on top of the water with a whole bunch of people you didn't see paddling like crazy behind the scenes. And their, their support um, was truly... Um, yeah, couldn't have done this without them. Missed my word there. I was like, couldn't figure out how to end that sentence. And of course, we again owe all of, we all owe thanks to our many speakers who did come dedicate a lot of their time and intellectual efforts to joining us. And I hope that you will be as enthusiastic in your welcome of our final speaker as you were to all the speakers throughout the series. And so it is my great delight to introduce tonight Rita Caldwell. Professor Caldwell is a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland in the Department of Cell Biology and Molecular Genetics. From 1998 to 2004, she also served as the director of the National Science Foundation and has worked in so many different capacities to promote um, science and scientific education and scientific exploration. Yet she has remained at the same time as help wearing these international hats for advocacy for science, also devoted to her research passions of studying human health, 
microbiology, and as she mentioned to me today, her, her true love of bacteria. And so this, um, she is such a wonderful model of continuing uh, academic and intellectual inquiry throughout one's career, even when the administration threatens to take over so much of your, of your um, efforts. She, because of this continued engagement and continued academic and scientific research, she was awarded the National Medal of Science in 2006. She was awarded the 2010 Stockholm Water Prize. Currently, she's working to develop an international network aimed at understanding and addressing climate change, disease, and access to safe and healthy drinking water. And as you can see, these concerns intersect so well with so many of the themes that we have already discussed here as part of the series. So I very much look forward to hearing much more about these pressing global concerns. I ask you to help me welcome Professor Caldwell. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I must say um, that it's amazing to see um, so many students just before Christmas with final exams. Thank you for being here. I'll try hard to convey some information. I also apologize that um, I'm one of the victims for whom the uh, flu vaccine didn't work, so I'm recovering from a bad cold. If I sound a little hoarse, it's because um, well, whatever they <clears throat> shot me up with didn't quite take. So um, I would like to, to spend some time with you this evening to talk about a subject that I think is very, very interdisciplinary and to give you a different focus on um, infectious disease, particularly waterborne disease. Uh, the assumption is that it's an infectious agent, and that's all there is to it. I'd like you to leave tonight thinking a little bit about what kind of effect climate change will have on human health, especially on waterborne diseases, infectious diseases. And then I'm going to share with you um, some very, very recent work that we've just begun. Uh, it's very exciting, and it's a new way of, of detecting and identifying pathogens bacteria, viruses, and fungi, just using sequences and being able to make the identification in a few minutes um, with the sequence. And then finally, with all this high-tech stuff, I'm going to describe a bit of some application to the remote villages in Bangladesh of the principles of science, but in a very simple form that improves their health. So let me start on this. Um, Odyssey tonight and just point out that waterborne diseases really are incredibly um, important and they're astoundingly uh, and have an astounding effect. For example, diarrheal diseases affect about one and a half billion people every year and a couple million people die, mostly kids under the age of five. Um, it was the number one killer now it, it's the second. The first is respiratory infections, but the diarrheal diseases, particularly cholera and related infections, are a major problem uh, in the developing world. And when you look at the other diseases that, have a, that are transmitted by water, probably only um, malaria is about as, as um, difficult in terms of its toll on human well-being and human life. Now, cholera is a, a global disease. It's basically a water-related diarrheal disease, and we've described it in pandemics because the records start probably, at least the written records for epidemiology about 1800, and um, the first massive wave of cholera was about 1823 that's been recorded. We're now in the seventh pandemic. That is, it started about 1960, uh, the particular kinds of microorganisms, uh, that is um, the serotype that uh, causes the disease. And so we're currently in what is called the seventh pandemic. But as you well know from reading the newspapers, um, this disease occurs just about everywhere. And it affects about seven million people every year. And um, just a um, few years ago in Haiti, 
uh, an epidemic was of massive proportion. And I'll have something to say about that because I think the principles of what I'm going to describe to you about the weather patterns and the infectious disease fits rather well with what happened in Haiti. Now, we've unfairly referred to the Bengal Delta as the native homeland of cholera, but I would say that more recently, it's really the countries in Africa that are now suffering the biggest epidemics um, and the most uh, massively devastating epidemics uh, of cholera. The um, bacteria exist in the environment. I'm not going to go into great detail because this is one of the first discoveries that my own laboratory made, and this was probably, I hate to say it to myself, about 40 years ago. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. Um, but we, we discovered that the cholera bacterium is naturally occurring. It's part of the natural flora in lakes, rivers, coastal waters, estuaries. Many of the strains are luminescent. That is, they glow, they produce the light. Uh, many of the strains can fix nitrogen. Uh, we're finding in the Gulf of Mexico where the terrible blowout occurred of the oil, um, the Deep Horizon oil spill, that many of the vibrios are becoming very abundant because they break down oil. So these are bacteria that are naturally occurring in the environment, and they pretty much exist uh, throughout the world. And we also know that there are new serotypes that are appearing. For 100 years, there was just one serotype, O1, the 01 serotype. But about 15 years ago, suddenly emerged another serotype. So now we know a whole lot more about the genetics, and I'll describe that before the evening is over. And frankly, we can um, clearly control cholera uh, by providing safe drinking water, because we in the United States, how many of you in this room, aside from those of you who have, might have gone to Asia and been told by your physician to have a vaccine, which, by the way, doesn't work very well, how many of you had a cholera vaccine? Very few, because we don't have the risk. We have water that is filtered, and it is chlorinated, and it's safely distributed, and we also have a very good sanitation system. Those are the two key components that prevent diarrheal diseases, particularly cholera. Now, um, just to show the bacteriology, this is the bacterium. It's a little curved shape rod that has a single tail of flagellum that provides motion to, allows it to swim through water, but it also can attach to surfaces and form biofilms. We grow it on a bacterial medium uh, that has a, a coloring agent in it, and so um, it's a biosulfate uh, sucrose, um, bile salts medium, and those bacteria that can break down the sucrose produce an acid and they produce this yellow colony. Now this is from uh, New York Times, about 1850. Um, this was um, a time when the epidemics of cholera hit New York, Washington, um, the Gulf, Florida. In fact, Washington, D.C. Um, had, um, oh, 100 years ago, yellow fever, typhoid fever, malaria, uh, as well as cholera. And back in the 1800s, it was thought that bad air, miasma, was what caused the disease. And so Washington was known as a miasmic swamp. I think it still is. <laughs> different reason, different reason. Anyway, this is um, the warrior. It says science. So science is asleep as the specter of cholera comes into New York City uh, in the 18, late 1800s when the uh, disease became uh, rampant. It's a, it's a global disease. The darker the color, the more intense the epidemics. Africa is uh, suffering a number of uh, epidemics, uh, Zimbabwe, um, Mozambique, um, and the Congo. Latin America, about 1992, um, had a recrudescence, a reemergence of cholera. We've generally referred to um, Indonesia and uh, India and Bangladesh, particularly, as the home of cholera, which is rather unfair because it, now we know it's global. But nevertheless, the work that I've done over the last 40 years has been mostly in Bangladesh, the influence of the Himalayas and the Gangetic Delta, and in an area known as Matlab near Dhaka, the capital city of Bangladesh, 
We've done our work in these remote villages where the houses are built around these ponds that are excavated because it's a very low-lying land with flooding a big problem. Now the relationship of cholera, uh, the bacterium to the environment has been very dramatically shown to be the sea surface temperature. These are NASA images for uh, to a couple decades that are imposed so that you can see as you saw the temperature fluctuating year by year and the sea surface height fluctuating because tidal flow is another influence because the bacteria are actually associated with plankton. And the effect is on the plankton, which in the spring and fall become very abundant in the coastal regions. And that becomes sort of the carrier for the disease. The uh, plankton are interesting little critters, um, zooplankton, particularly the copepods. And um, here is a copepod. And summarizing probably 20 years' work, I would say that um, the bacteria in the water are also on, in the gut and on the surface of the copepod. The uh, copepod is food for shellfish, and it is also the bacteria uh, are in the gut of crabs because they too feed on plankton, they're plankton feeders as well. And as a result, when you have conditions with very poor sanitation, um, you have, of course, uh, epidemics occurring. But fundamentally, the source is the environment. Now, there are many other uh, critters that uh, can be coated with the bacteria, but basically, this is the host. One of the reasons is because it's a crustacean. It has um, that hard white shell, you know, from crabs. Well, the copepod, if you want to think of it as a miniature crab, it's not really that, but think of it that way. It has a hard chitin, which is an N-acetylglucosamine polymer. It's hard. And vibrios, vibrio cholerae included, break down chitin. So it's a kind of a cycle of a, of a relationship where the healthy copepod hosts the bacteria, and when the copepod um, then reaches senescence, the bacteria recycle the copepod, so to speak, um, into the um, uh, fundamental components. Now, those, that's sort of the micro scale. I'm going to move now to the macro scale. What, what does climate change and what does climate have to do with a disease and a major you know, epidemic of cholera? Uh, studies have been done showing that rainfall is a big factor when it's very heavy rain in India where there's poor sanitation um, and uh, a lot of crowding then a cholera epidemic can break out. Similarly when there's flooding in Bangladesh and that happens every year uh, cases of cholera occur with unfortunate regularity. Um, how high the river is has a, is a factor because as the water depth recedes in the spring when droughts or drought-like conditions occur then there's a lot of turbidity, and then the bacteria are numerous. And in the fall, when the monsoon rains come in, then the flooding causes, again, the sanitation being poor, then people drinking that water without filtration become ill. Uh, we also know, well, obviously, fecal contamination accounts for some of the major epidemics. But one of the relationships that we worked out was that if we could measure um, <clears throat> uh, plankton, which you can by satellite, uh, it struck us that, you know, we could measure chlorophyll, which gives us the phytoplankton, and the zooplankton feed on the phytoplankton, so we could calculate the numbers of, phyto, of zooplankton by first measuring by satellite in the Bay of Bengal, and then be able to predict these outbreaks of cholera. And so doing our work in the Bay of Bengal, and particularly in the Sundarbans, the lower part of Bangladesh, where I've been working there since oh, about 1975, when I made my first trip, we did some studies. This was about um, 20 years ago. Um, at first, it was kind of interesting. I called my friends at NASA and said, you know, I'm thinking about using some of your data for um, measuring chlorophyll from uh, satellites, and could I have the data? Well, this was 
20 years ago. We didn't have computers. You couldn't download in the computer. And they said, sure. So they sent me this tape about this big and about that thick. And I said, what am I going to do with this? So I wasn't really able to get started until about 1990 when we began recording, interestingly, in Bangladesh, in Matlab, at the hospital, we were counting the patients coming in, and then we were able then to get from NASA the sea surface temperature measured by satellite, and then just making the correction for um, the, the time lag, we were able to get a rather good correlation. This was the first correlation that we did. Just measuring uh, sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, and um, sea surface height, the tidal height, those factors, which was all you could measure by satellite in 19, uh, 1987, 88, um, through um, uh, the year 2000. We've since then developed much more sophisticated models. And uh, this is for Calcutta, or Kolkata as it's now known, and uh, Matlab, which is the village uh, area outside of Dhaka. And we were able to develop a rather good correlation between um, the uh, models that we, could, we had developed and the measurements we could make by satellite. The, this was so good that um, we were able to calculate that for every milligram per cubic meter increase in chlorophyll, you'd get about a 33% increase in cholera. Very, very direct correlation. And for rainfall, for every millimeter per day increase in rainfall, about a 7% increase in the number of cholera cases. And similarly for Matlab, Bangladesh. So, so what I'm telling you is that we now can take satellite measurements and we can, with mathematical calculation and model building, we can actually determine the conditions of when and where outbreaks very likely uh, will occur. Uh, to the point that we now have been able to separate what we call epidemic cholera from endemic. Now, what does that mean? Well, endemic means that every spring and every fall, there will be cholera in Bangladesh along the coast. And that's because the plankton populations come in on a, on a, on a spring and fall basis, they take their water directly for drinking and cooking and bathing and so forth from the rivers without any treatment and from ponds. And so there's constantly cholera. Epidemic is when inland um, there may be years, particularly in India, years where there isn't any cholera. Then all of a sudden, wham, there's a huge epidemic. What are the conditions that, that, are, that cause that? So what we did was go back, <clears throat> because in London, in the Museum of Natural History, they've got all the records that the colonials, the British colonials, gathered um, during their time of occupying India. And the records for cholera and malaria, and uh, some of the um, records as well for temperature um, and uh, rainfall that they recorded meticulously, we were able to get the data um, from about 1873 to 1948 and transfer it all to computers. Now, we're working right now in this particular area um, because New Delhi is inland and it records epidemic cholera. In other words, there'll be years, maybe a case or two, then all of a sudden, wham, there's a huge epidemic. And the conditions then we studied. And it, by looking very carefully at these uh, community data from the records in London, we were able to find some very interesting um, facts. First of all, as the temperature increased, when there's a high temperature for two months prior to a heavy rainfall, then the conditions for cholera are met. So, Essentially, there are three major factors. When the air temperature is above average for the two previous months, when the rainfall is significantly above average, and you've got conditions of, of uh, perhaps in the case of 
Delhi, a religious festival where many, many, many people come in and you've essentially got the equivalent of refugee camps, poor sanitation. So you've got the factors then wham that all come together and then the epidemic occurs. Now, could we have predicted the Haitian outbreak? Um, that outbreak um, shows us that cholera is still a global threat. All of a sudden, what happened in Haiti was that in the year 2010, this was four years ago, in January, there was a massive earthquake, a Richter scale 7, 7.5, I think it was. The um, outbreak um, caused severe disruption in a country where the sanitation conditions were already bad anyway. So you ended up with people clustered together in refugee camps where their homes had been destroyed. And then it turns out that it was the hottest summer on record. And then in the fall, the heaviest rainfall. I'll give you the data in a moment. But the epidemic, theoretically, uh, occurred here inland, where, and this is very controversial, so I'm sharing this with you, where the um, UN peacekeeping troops located. And so the claim has been made that they actually brought cholera to Haiti. Um, it turns out that two years earlier, there had been an outbreak of cholera in Nepal, but the troops that had gone into Haiti two years later had all tested negative. Nevertheless, they claim that the poor sanitation conditions, because the stra one of the strains that had been isolated was very similar to the Nepal cholera strain. So there was a leaping, in my view, to co the conclusion that they brought the cholera with them. However, what was occurring in Haiti simultaneously were cases throughout the country. And working with a team from Tufts University engineers, um, who are water engineers, hydrologists, we measured the flow of the Acerobenete River down to the coast. And it isn't fast enough for the contamination to be brought simultaneously to the entire country. Now, um, one of the things we were able to do in November of that year when the outbreak was occurring, working with Dr. Prosper, a Haitian physician, we were able to get um, from 80 patients, cholera patients, um, stool samples that we could plate out and determine if the bacterium were present and make isolations. Now, the data for the environment shows that the air temperature in Haiti in 2010 was the highest in um, 50 years. The rainfall in Haiti, in red, was the most intense in 50 years because the, these lines are the uh, averages of 50 years of data. So in 2010, it was the hottest previous two months. Um, it was the hottest summer. And then in the fall, just before the outbreak occurred, there was a hurricane that skirted the island and dropped the, a heavy amount of rain on the island. So there was flooding. So you've got then all of the factors of, of, of disruption, poor sanitation system, crowded conditions, heavy, hot summer, and a heavy, intense rainfall. Well, let me give you some of the data on the genomics. So in uh, the year 2000, my uh, former student, John Heidelberg, who had postdoc at Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research, um, along with our lab at Maryland, his former lab uh, location, and with John Macalanos from Harvard University, we sequenced completely the genome of Vibrio cholerae, the causative agent of cholera. And we proved that um, it does have two chromosomes. Until that time, it was hypothesized that all bacteria had one chromosome. Uh, since then, we now know that there are other bacteria related to the Vibrios that do have two chromosomes. But in any case, it was the first sequence, entire genomic sequence of Vibrio cholerae. Since then, we have sequenced about 250 strains of cholera bacteria from all over the world, from India, Asia, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, from the Chesapeake Bay, um, from um, uh, Africa, 
And the sequence is very interesting because um, each of these are different strains. And as if you, if you could just think of this as that first vibrio cholerae chromosome stretched out, and then all of these other stretched out chromosomes laid out one by one. The uh, one, first chromosome, the big chromosome, and the second small chromosome and you find that none of them are absolutely identical to the other. This was kind of an interesting observation. It means that this bacterium has a great deal of versatility. In fact, we have since been able to show that 80% of this bacterium, those genes can be transferred from one bacterium to another. It's very, very um, um, uh, promiscuous, I guess you might say, with its genetic complement. Now, of those bacteria from Haiti, we found that um, of the 81 stool samples, only 41 of them, just half of them, actually had the Vibrio cholerae uh, um, epidemic strain, so-called epidemic strain. Uh, 20 of the other samples had the non-epidemic strains present and did not have the epidemic strain. And then about uh, 20 of the samples didn't have any Vibrios, but had a very powerful, uh, Aeromona species, which we know can come, we can pick up on the same medium as the Vibrio cholerae. And we sequenced all of these bacteria from Haiti, and the conclusion was that they formed their own separate group when compared with all the other strains from, from Asia and Africa and the U.S. and South America, etc. And by doing a mathematical principal component analysis of the data, we found that indeed they formed their own cluster, but just one of the strains um, uh, from outside the cloud um, could be seen that was different. And that strain turned out to be a strain from Zambia instead of the other strains from uh, Africa uh, and from, from other parts of the world. So the conclusion was, based on the genomics, that, well, there was a Vibrio cholerae strain that was uh, very dominant in uh, Haiti, but it was not exactly precisely the same as the Nepal strain. And furthermore, the conditions were very, very typical of, of the epidemic kind of cholera as we had described from the historic data in India. Now, um, the, for, the, for those of you that are interested in the genomics, there are a variety of differences with polymorphisms of certain genes and mutations in some of the other genes. So the conclusion is that it's a much more complicated situation rather than simply ascribing the entire epidemic to the introduction by the peacekeeping troops. It's much more complicated and it is uh, what I would call biocomplexity at its finest, that is climate, the uh, uh, conditions under which the people are living, and the um, transmission through poor sanitation. Now, what I would like to tell you a little bit about is the work we're doing that is really quite fascinating. So fascinating that we've actually formed a company in order to get this into uh, medical application as soon as possible. What we've been able to do is use next generation sequencing, that is, You've been reading about how we can sequence the human geno genome, bacteria, um, plants, animals, whatever. Um, let me see, where am I going here? Um, what we've been able to do is develop a um, mathematical algorithm. Have I gone too far? Yeah. A mathematical algorithm that takes the sequence that comes from the sequencing machine and very rapidly, with a very elegant mathematical approach, match and bin the sequences as they come off the machine so that we can identify right down to species and strain. Now, if any of you are doing any genomics, you know that 16S is currently used. It's a way of taking a gene and then mapping other strains against it to do, to do identification. Well, what we've been able to do is use the whole um, sequence that comes out of the sequencing machine. And then the question is, well, why is it important to know 
whether it's a certain species or a certain strain. It turns out that it, it really is very important because let's just take E. coli, which every one of us in this room has E. coli in our gut. And the good E. coli, that I hope we all have in our gut and not the bad E. coli, um, help us by producing vitamins um, and they prevent other pathogens that you may have ingested from actually colonizing your intestine and making you ill. But there are some strains that carry certain genes that cause food poisoning. And these, there are a variety of pathotypes that cause a, a hemorrhagic uh, reaction in your intestinal wall or produce a toxin that uh, causes a loss of fluid and in the form of diarrhea and can cause vomiting and so forth. So knowing what strain is present is really very important. How do we do this? Well, you've got a sample. It can be a fecal sample, it can be a food sample, or it can be a sample um, from sputum or from blood. And we extract the DNA. Uh, the DNA is extracted by very standard techniques that I guess you can even do in high school now. And then we um, sequence the um, uh, extracted DNA the uh, sequence comes out in little fragments, about 100 base pairs uh, to two, 100 to 200 base pairs. And then with this mathematical approach, we match the sequence reads against the library of all the sequence strains. And we have about 15,000 strains that have been sequenced. And we have very highly curated, uh, cleaned out any errors of, um, of, in the DNA. And then we do this match. And that matching is done in a, a probabilistic way. It allows us to identify the bacteria present in that sample. And then we can even uh, match them against our libraries of genes that code resistance to antibiotics or pathogenicity traits. And that allows us to identify, identify the bacteria and also to tell you exactly whether they're resistant to an antibiotic or sensitive to it so that you can very precisely treat an infection. And my ambition is that in about two or three years, your physician will have a handheld device so that when you go in for a physical and you say, you know, I've got a lousy sore throat, uh, and he does a swab, today that swab goes into a test tube, it gets labeled, gets put in a slot, it gets picked up by a delivery person, goes to LabCorp or Quest, and then a week later, you're told, well, it wasn't strep, we don't know what it was, but if the antibiotic works, you're fine. Or, you, so that means you're either well or you're dead. Now, we'd like to change that. We'd like to change that so that when you are in the physician's office and that swab is taken, within about 20 minutes or maybe a half hour, the physician will say, you know, that Streptococcus pyogenes, and uh, it's really um, resistant, unfortunately, to penicillin, but we've got a derivative, and it will work. So I'll give you the uh, prescription for this precise treatment against that infection. So that's where we're aiming for. Uh, we've done some studies that have been very interesting that I'll uh, explain in a minute. Uh, in Calcutta, India, uh, using this technique, and this was quite fascinating because um, what we arranged with a team for the cholera hospital in Calcutta, India, was that they would give us 50 patient stool sample DNA extracted, and that they would test each of those samples for about 25 pathogens. Giardia, Cryptosporidium, these are parasites, and entamoeba, viruses, um, uh, a variety of enteric viruses, and then a whole bunch of enteric pathogens, Salmonella, Shigella, and E. coli, and so forth. And then they would give us the DNA blinded, and we would do our test, and then we would tell them what we picked up, and they would tell us what we, they found. One of the big surprises, big surprises, was that we expected that cholera patients coming in, well, they'd have Vibrio cholera. Guess what? They have between four and 10 pathogens. Not only do they have Vibrio cholerae, and sometimes they don't even have Vibrio cholerae, but they have instead other pathogens that mimic the symptoms, but they would have 
50% of them had giardia, which is a parasite. About 60% uh, of them would have rotavirus, which is an enteric virus. And then most of them would have a mix of other pathogens, Salmonella, Shigella, and so forth. So we are now developing the hypothesis that what lands you in the hospital may not necessarily be a single pathogen. It's more likely to be a community or a mixture in that we already know that when the Giardia parasite is present, the Vibrio cholerae produces more toxin, which makes you sicker. So there's, there's this going on, this interaction that's going on in the gut. In any case, what we did was just to get a picture of what the gut flora of the Indian population, because we also had controls who were not ill, about a dozen of those. So we, we pooled the data to get kind of the average gut flora of the average Indian. And we downloaded all of the NIH data that, uh, that had been contributed to get a sense of the NIH uh, 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 study on the human microbiome, where they've been studying many hundreds of patients, of uh, people, not just patients, but human, us Americans, to find out what kind of bacteria do we carry in our gut well, it's very interesting. What we find is that when we, this means the um, Human Microbiome Project, the NIH data, we find that this is what most of us in this room carry in our gut, these kinds of bacteria. What's interesting is that in the Indian uh, gut, they carry a whole lot more of what we would call pathogens. There are various types of uh, E. coli that carry some pathogenic traits or some milder forms of Salmonella or Shigella. But the other thing that's interesting is they also, the, the, this blue line, are the kinds of bacteria that you would get from eating yogurt or any kind of probiotic that's recommended when you've been, been treated with antibiotics. Well, in India, they have the, the population there has a much larger population because yogurt is part of the natural everyday diet. So that may have evolved as, as over the years of eating yogurt as a protection against the larger number of pathogens because of the poor sanitation conditions. The, the diarrheal patients, we were able to um, uh, identify pathogens by our technique, which they were not able to identify using all those, those standard culture techniques and tissue culture techniques for viruses and so forth. And so we were able to confirm when, when they told us that, yes, there was Vibrio cholera there, we were able to pick it up, but we were also able to identify pathogens when they were not able to do so. In fact, we could show the difference. Again, this is the human microbiome. We, we Westerners carry very few pathogens, whereas the Indian population carries a whole mix of the known enteric pathogens. Um, so this has been a very interesting finding and it's being written up for publication. The main thing to show here is that, that this is very, very fast. If any of you have done any genomic studies, um, you know that it takes a long time. We've been able to accomplish what we do. Uh, once you have the sequence, it takes two to 10 minutes to do all the analysis. So you don't have to do any any amplification or any, any test tubes uh, culturing or anything. You simply take a sample, I'll just repeat, take a sample, blood sample or stool sample, extract the DNA, and we can remove the human, because there's always some human DNA, and then just with what's left of the microbial DNA, it, once that's sequenced, which probably takes maybe, that alone may take a couple of hours now, but once you've got the sequence, within about two to 10 minutes, we can tell you exactly what's there down to species and strain. So that, that's where genomics and genetics is going right now. Now, why would you care about this? Why would you want to know what's in your gut? Well, it turns out from studies that have been done that the bacteria in your gut will influence whether you're fat or skinny. It turns out that, that individuals who tend to gain weight easily have bacteria that are highly efficient and produce more of nutrient that's absorbed. And that's been published not by us, but by other people. It's also been shown that bacteria in your gut produce compounds that make you feel good or bad. 
make you depressed or happy. So what's going on in your gut, in fact, is so important that some people now refer to it as another organ of the human body, like the heart or the lung. So this is what's happening right now in the world of genomics and in the world of, of understanding personalized medicine. The other thing that I might mention is that there is in, uh, in uh, uh, nursing homes and, and in neonatal critical care units a bacterium that really is a nasty, it's Clostridium difficile. And it's really very difficult to treat and it's often antibiotic resistant. But it's been discovered, and this works, sounds gross, but it works, that if you have a relative who is not ill, and if the bacteria in that relative's intestine can be introduced into your intestine if you have this bacterium, it then knocks out the bacterium, and this fecal transplant is now being used very successfully uh, already. In this past year, so much has been happening. Now, let me close by just saying, I've been talking about sequencing and satellites and models and mathematics. How, how, did, how could we take the knowledge that we have learned and bring it to these villagers in Bangladesh to prevent them from coming down with cholera? So what we did about a decade ago, because we had learned that the cholera bacterium is associated with copepods, and these are kind of, kind of the elephants of the microscopic world, and it occurred to us that, you know, if you could just filter out the, this stuff from the water, you could reduce cholera. And so we, we applied to the NIH, um, and we got a negative response on the first attempt. Uh, the reviewer said, ah, no man is going to drink, no male in a Bangladesh village is going to drink uh, water that's been passed through a seri cloth because we had proposed using seri cloth because we had found from laboratory experiments that when you folded this fine gauze-like seri cloth that women use for their clothing and you folded it about four or five times and then you poured the water through, you removed 99% of the bacteria. Not all of them, but 99%. And that was part of our proposal. And the reviewer said, no man's going to drink water in Bangladesh uh, that's gone through clothes that woman has worn. So we, we got a $100,000 uh, trial grant from the uh, Thrasher Foundation to go in and just do a trial test. And you know, we found out that the men in Bangladesh use seri cloth to filter the flies from their beer. So my, my moral to you students is when your proposal is rejected, just look at the reviewer's comments, revise the proposal, and resubmit it. Because we resubmitted a proposal with the evidence that it would work it would, uh, and, and that it could be, could be accomplished. But even then, the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases thought it was too unsophisticated and sent it over to the Nursing Institute, which funded it. But that's okay. Thank you, Nursing Institute. So we did a three-year study. And what we did was to uh, hire women to be our extension agents and to go out to the selected villages that we very carefully, statistically selected villages. There were, 100, there were 50 villages and a total of 150,000 people. And, and the, con the uh, control that we did not uh, teach them how to filter, but we just taught them how to clean their water containers well, very well. And then we uh, had the women educate the ones that were going to do the seri filtration also to clean the filtering units well, but also to use the seri cloth. And the seri cloth is simply about a yard of this very fine cloth, and the expensive stuff was no better than the cheapest rags that were used, so it made it very inexpensive. And we taught them that, not, that they, what they do is fold it so you get a kind of a four-layer filter, and then after the filtration, then to rinse it and then put it in the sunlight because the sunlight acts as a disinfectant. And um, for the women, it was no problem explaining to them that, look, this is after filtration. This stuff in the water, particularly the stuff you see swimming, is not good for your children. So it didn't take much instruction for them to understand that this was better 
for the kids. And sure enough, we reduced the um, cholera by 50% in those villages by that simple technique. So I'm going to close with the words of John Muir, um, the founder of the Sierra Club. And he said, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he, and I would add he and she, finds it hitched to the rest of the universe. And so I would like to thank the many, many people who have worked for him, former students and postdocs and teamwork uh, with fellows from, uh, men and women from the uh, International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research in Bangladesh, the uh, lab in Calcutta, the folks from NASA Ames who are very, very helpful, and uh, colleagues from all around the world. Um, it's a um, special acknowledgement uh, for the DNA work. Um, these are the folks who have been really, really uh, super, and in particular, Dr. Huck, um, who was my PhD student 30 years ago, went back to Bangladesh uh, to head up the labs there, and then I coerced him, or enticed him, I should say, back to Maryland. To He's now a professor at the university, and we work together. Um, Antar Jutla was the one, chap who did the modeling uh, in Haiti. Uh, Sion Young is fantastic in doing the genomics, as is uh, Nur Hassan. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for um, having me speak to you. But remember, we do need to help the women and children of the world have access to safe drinking water. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. And for those that saw the scope of the acknowledgments sheet, that's collaboration and interdisciplinarity at work. That's what it looks like outside the classroom of the liberal arts school. So thank you so much for this, for this talk. Um, questions? So the... Um, solution you had for the women in Bangladesh, has that been tried anywhere else? Uh, we're trying to introduce it to, uh, into Africa and uh, trying to find a, a cloth that is ev everybody would have and not be very expensive. And so um, that's, and we're also in the process right now, literally, in fact, uh, this morning I was on the phone with my colleagues in Norway and Bangladesh to do a study where we want to see whether we can improve the efficacy of the cholera vaccine if we also introduce filtration and, and safe water for the kids. So thank you for the question. Hi, uh, I enjoyed your talk. And I had a, the question about the microbiome between the Indian population really intrigued me, especially the higher rate of pathogens that they seem to have. And so and you mentioned that the, the sample was of both patients and non-patients, so healthy yes. individuals as well. So even healthy individuals seem to have higher rates of pathogens. So I was curious, though, if they have higher rates of pathogens, they're not getting you know, symptoms of infection. Is this due to other uh, genetic aspects or other things that in their own genomes that they're combating the pathogens in some way? Or you show the higher level of probiotics or other bacteria. So do you think it's the probiotics that are countering those pathogens? or? Some mix of that. I think you've answered your own question, and it's, a, it's both. Uh, and I, and I and noticed that there were, we, we Westerners um, in the human microbiome also carry small numbers of pathogens. And I, I, I think that is how we maintain our immune system so it's constantly um, protective. And so that constant exposure to very, very small numbers probably is part of the uh, immune protective mechanism of the human body. Uh, hello. Uh, I would like to ask how the idea of folding the cloth came to you. And uh, the other question I have is, uh, by uh, leaving all of the debris uh, on top of the cloth, does that mean the cholera tends to stick on it? Is that why when you keep it, less goes in? Yeah, the, the uh, bacteria uh, attach to particulates. And, and they're part of the natural flora. Like, you should think of the copepod um, as to the vibrio. Um, 
as part of its gut flora. In other words, we uh, humans have a lot of E. coli in our gut, but in the copepod, the vibrio, vibrios, not necessarily just the cholera vibrio, but other vibrios as well, are, are naturally part of the uh, estuarine and freshwater uh, flora, bacterial flora. So, so the um, bacteria tend to attach to surfaces. They have a free swimming stage, but they also have a sessile or an attached stage. And so what you're doing is actually uh, collecting out the copepods, which uh, uh, in the spring are very numerous and in the fall are again very numerous because that's when the peak uh, 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 the, the plankton population occurs. And so at those times is when you get the epidemics. And that, we, in our minds, was, whoa, that's where they're coming from, the massive copepods. So if we can screen out the copepods, filter them out, that was where the idea came from. It was putting together the climate and the water and um, the time of year that the epidemics were occurring. It's called deduction. <laughs> Hi, could you comment on, uh, because of the relationship you've shown between uh, temperature and increased precipitation, obviously those are also um, modeled for future and in in ongoing right now in climate change. So could you comment on not only what it might mean to epidemics, but also geographically what it might mean yes. for expanding ranges? That is a perfect question because we've been doing some work with some wonderful scientists. Carla Pruzzo in Genoa, Italy, and with a team um, um, in France. Uh, and we, what they, what Carla, it was just her idea, she's fantastic. Um, what we have done is we have learned that in Liverpool, England, they have what's called plankton toes of opportunity. They've been collecting plankton for the last 40 or 50 years from um, um, in, just off the coast of England and um, ships going uh, from one continent to another, they'll collect plankton and then just uh, describe them and store them. So we went back together, we went back and those plankton from 40 years ago and 39 years ago and 38, et cetera, we extracted the DNA and then we probed genetically using gene uh, detection. We were able to show that in fact, as the water temperature has been warming, with global warming, the numbers of vibrios have been going up. And a group in Denmark uh, latched onto this and they then did the epidemiology and they showed that with warming that the number of cases of vibrio infections, because other vibrios produce um, food, food, uh, seafood poisoning, a vibrio perimeliticus, and then there's a really nasty vibrio vulnificus which really can uh, liquefy internal organ, which it's a, it's a nasty one, it kills you. So, so those numbers have been going up and the infection rates have been going up. And in Alaska, for the first time about three or four years ago, for the first time in ever, cases of Vibrio perimeliticus have been occurring and now they now monitor for it because the numbers of cases are going up. So uh, clearly there is an effect in the in the oceans uh, with warming, with the numbers of vibrios going up and they, they are potentially pathogenic. And we know that they're global because in Iceland, one of my former students went, um, went to Iceland on a Fulbright and isolated vibrio cholerae from the geothermally heated waters off the coast of Iceland and they've never had cholera in Iceland. So the bacteria are distributed Globally, we know that. And we also know that they are definitely influenced by the warming of the sea uh, temperatures. So thank you for, the, for asking the question. So I must say this is the work that I'm reporting of 40 years and um, 58 PhDs. They have all, they're all gainfully employed and none is in jail. And I think that's a really good <laughs> All right, um, so you mentioned in your talk that 
personalized medicine is becoming coming more to the forefront. Do you think that in the future when we fill out like a medical history form, we're going to have to say like, it, here has your genome been sequenced and has your gut bacteria been analyzed or stuff like that? Is there, do you think there's a push in the community for that kind of stuff? Well, um, my daughter is a physician and she's been sending me the stuff that she gets sent to her as a physician. And um, just, um, just today or yesterday, I guess, um, there's now a little kit that is being sold where you can do your own diagnosis from um, just spitting into a tube. So um, I think we're getting to the point where, let's put it this way, I think we're gaining very useful information that we haven't had in the past. To me, I think it's really important to modernize infectious disease diagnosis. We, we have to move, uh, my husband's a physicist and, and you know, if, if a physicist of 1700 were to walk into a physics lab today, he wouldn't know what was going on. But if Louis Pasteur, famous microbiologist of 1890, were to walk into a microbiology lab today, he'd just roll up his sleeves and say, just give me some Petri dishes and, and I, I'll transfer some cultures. We have to change that. We have to modernize the identifications and, and um, the, the whole process of infectious disease diagnosis. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier that when Giardia and the cholera are both present, the Giardia causes the cholera to produce more toxins and it makes the person sicker. Do we have any idea why this occurs? Uh, no, we don't know that, and, and um, I wouldn't want you to come away saying it's a causation. All I can say is that it's related. When it's present, it's, it, the, there is more toxin produced by the Vibrio cholerae from the same sample. So, so there's something going on that we need to find out what it is. It's some sort of synergism, which isn't surprising, because when you have a community of, 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 of microorganisms, they're, they're interacting. Uh, either by producing substances that will prevent the others becoming ascendant and more numerous, or uh, actually killing them, because bacteria themselves carry viruses, bacterial viruses, and they, these will prevent their enemies from attacking them. So there's a very interesting sociology going on at the microbial level that we're just beginning to understand. I think I've worn them out. If not, I'd just like to say thank you very much, and I love coming back to uh, this university. I think you kids are lucky. You're getting a very good education, and you've got some trem tremendous faculty, so um, go forth and do good with your educations. Thank you.